Well, thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak to you. I always like doing these sorts of events because it's very important, I think, and I know you all do, that we do really get changes in the law, not only in Germany but other countries in Europe, so that we do have a reasonable, decent and humane system. And I, I, my own personal view is that what we should be looking to do is to abolish prostitution altogether and make sure that it just doesn't happen. That's where I would like to end up, but of course we are a long way from that. And as you all know probably more than I do, there are various views across Europe about prostitution and about how you should regulate it, if at all, what the law should be and what the law should aim to do. And what I've been asked to do in this talk to you is go through the countries in the EU and other parts of Europe and explain the systems that exist there and so that we can all get a picture of what happens and what needs to change. Before I start doing that, I will admit that I have a very particular point of view. Um, I did, in fact, do a report for the European Parliament. It's, it's a long time ago now, it was in February 2013. It still seems only a few days ago that that went through. Um, sadly, not much has been done since. But my report was very clear that what we should be aiming for is the Swedish model the Nordic model whereby it is the buyer of sexual services who in almost all instances is a man. Um, prostitution is men or women. It's, uh, th there is a little bit of same sex prostitution but very little indeed. Um, so that was my report. So that's very much the position I'm coming from. But I know that's not what the law is here in Germany and it's not what happens in many other parts of Europe. And it's essentially a neoliberal case, which says basically that people can do what they choose to do, um, and therefore prostitution is a choice, and if women want to do it, fair enough. And against the idea that prostitution is exploitation of women, uh, and for, for prostitution, and some people believe this, and I do in most cases actually, that prostitution is violence against women. It violates women's own agency to carry out her life and do what and, and her own body, and it's a, it's a form of sexual violence. And we know that actually women in prostitution do face extraordinary levels of violence. I mean, it's something which isn't talked about very much, but positive, they, they face women in prostitution face violence from those who pay for their bodies and actually also more generally from society. Uh, certainly in London, there's, there are regular, I'll come and explain later, the rather tangled legal system in the UK about prostitution. But essentially, if you're running a brothel, it's illegal, it's a criminal offence, which allows the police, and it's happened quite regularly in London, to raid brothels. And, and that, again, is a form of violence. There's a form of violence in the, the relationship that women would have with the men who buy sex. And there's also a much wider social violence against women in prostitution. And there's this whole question of choice, which I, I do want to talk about briefly now. So, prostitution is not a lifestyle choice. There have been various television programs and things in magazines making it out to be something that women choose to do and they have a great time. And that's just not the case for the overwhelming majority of women in prostitution. A lot of them are actually trafficked from other parts of Europe. The EU has, a, a, and one of its officials, who is a coordinator working against human trafficking and has produced a lot of good work and a lot of statistics. And the over 85% of those who are trafficked into Europe are trafficked for sexual exploitation, and most of them are women. So it's, human trafficking is very much part of prostitution. 
And not surprisingly, in countries where prostitution is legal, rates of human trafficking are higher, because it's obviously easier for traffickers to bring people in to countries where the law helps them than to go to countries where it's difficult. I mean, human trafficking is a criminal offence in every European country, but of course, if prostitution is legal, that makes the end of the, the trail much easier to deal with. So there's an overwhelming majority of women in prostitution who have been and are victims of human trafficking. There's also a high number, and it's difficult, as with a lot of this, to find statistics on it, but there's a high number of women who have suffered from sexual abuse of one form or another, um, and, and that's really very prevalent. None of these women obviously choose to do it, and, and, and I've actually, and over the course of working this, do, writing my report and after, I've met quite a lot of women in, in prostitution, quite a lot of survivors, and some women who claim that they chose to do it. And even those who claim that they chose to do it seem to have some sort of background of abuse. And I have yet to meet a woman who, like us, who said, right, I'm going off to work in prostitution. That's my career choice. It just doesn't happen. And I think the real test of this is, I'm sure a lot of you have got daughters. And if you or any other woman, daughter came to, to you or to her mother, and said, when I grow up, I want to be a prostitute. I mean, this is just not a career option. It just really isn't. And I think it's important that we keep saying this, that going into prostitution is never a choice. It's forced upon the women who do it. The other, of course, big driver is poverty. But it's forced upon women in various ways. And it's not a lifestyle choice. It's not a career choice. And those women in prostitution would, on the whole, not every one of them, but on the whole, women in prostitution want to get out of it. So that's us opening and into the debate. Um, and we need to, I think, look at it in those kinds of terms and how, how we're going to change the laws if indeed that's what you want to do and how it works and learn from other parts of Europe because there are very different forms and laws about prostitution in other European countries, which is why it makes having a common EU protocol on prostitution actually very difficult. Uh, we couldn't do it anyway because law and order issues are actually done, as you all know, at member state level. Uh, but we could have more sort of general direction probably from the EU, but it's very hard at the moment because there's so many different forms of law about prostitution in other European countries. But that's why, I, why it's important to do what you're doing and come together to change the laws in your own country, because that's what you can do. Is that, can you still hear? No, all right, good. Yes. Uh, if we move on to what happens in other countries, um, I have talked briefly, and we'll start with this, which is the abolitionist model, uh, which is essentially what happens in Sweden and Norway and actually various other parts of the EU. Uh, it's the law which should seek to prohibit organised and exploitative forms of prostitution, including brothels, pimping and sex trafficking. The abolitionist model does view prostitution as undesirable uh, and would seek to make it, to, to, to really get rid of it. Um, countries which take that as a principle, though they deal with it in different ways, is actually most of Europe, Belgium, Bulgaria, Cyprus, Czech Republic, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Hungary, Italy, Latvia, Luxembourg, Poland, Portugal. So they don't all do necessarily conform to the Swedish model, but those countries are opposed to prostitution, they don't think it's desirable, and they would like eventually to abolish it. The Swedish model is the one that I think is the best to be adopted across the EU if we ever get to that point, and certainly in countries 
like Germany, where you may eventually campaign to change the law, I would like to see it introduced in the UK. And we're a long way from any movement in Britain on prostitution. Uh, but basically, the, in Sweden, it's essentially that the buyer of sex, which is almost always, in 99% of cases, is a man. And it's, it, it is illegal to buy sexual services. That's the criminal offence. So the, it is not illegal to sell sex, as it were. So the, the woman concerned is not committing any offence. And this was introduced in Sweden a long time ago now, in 1999. Um, in addition to buying sex being illegal, soliciting, which is going out and uh, the, the woman going out and looking for, for customers, as it were, uh, brothels and procuring are all illegal. Um, so it's, it's very clear in Sweden and in Norway where this model works, what it's about. Um, and I, I've actually visited Stockholm <coughs> a few times to see how it works there. And they do have not only this law, which is very radical, which they've had for a long time, they also have a much more sympathetic attitude to the women working in prostitution. It was, it was very striking when I met on the last visit the, the police chief who basically has responsibility for this, who actually is a woman. And they, they, they do have, feel they've got a duty of care to the women who work in prostitution. They, they, they feel they need to make sure they're all right. And they do set up or help fund programs to help the women to leave prostitution. And I did actually visit a refuge where the women could go to do exactly that. So it's actually very progressive and, and seems to be working well because Sweden's very committed to it. Before they introduced the law in 1999, they had a massive public consultation which I think the Swedes are probably very good at. I mean, we never have public consultations in Britain, so I was quite intrigued by this idea. But they do in Sweden. They have these great conversations about things, which is wonderful. So when it came to actually be adopted as the law, people were ready for it. And there is quite a lot of evidence that it's actually changed attitudes and that prostitution for men to go and buy sex is a, is a, a lot more... Um, it, it's just not viewed as a good thing. Um, and and it, that attitude has changed, changed slowly over the years. So men of, the male attitude to buying sex from women really is changing significantly. And that's been, I think, one of the real, real success stories of this. Um, and the number of women in prostitution, in street prostitution, has declined. It's gone down by almost half. What has gone up, though, is the whole issue of the internet and prostitution over the internet. This obviously is quite a new, a newish phenomenon, and I don't think anyone really has thought about this very much and how we deal with it, because introducing laws which are, which work on the streets, which are relatively easy to enforce because people are physically there in one space are a lot more difficult if you've got whoever it may be, women, pimps, whatever it is, working over the internet. And this is something which always comes up when you talk about the Nordic model. Well, it's all right, they've gone, they're not on the streets, they've gone underground, they now do it over the internet. Um, that's, that may be true, but I don't think that changes the principle of it, that the way to deal with it, this is to make um, is to make buying sex the criminal offence and not make the woman who is the victim in all of this the criminal. So that's basically how it works in Sweden and Norway. And in France, rather interestingly, France introduced this in, not very long ago, only a couple of years ago, in 2016. Um, and it's very much along the lines of the Swedish model. That was actually, I, re I remember, I was quite... I mean, I followed the, the whole debate in France and, and as it went through the National Assembly and the Senate with, in quite some detail. 
and it took it wasn't it was the socialist uh, as we had the before Macron the, the socialist presidency um, who actually introduced it and the socialist minister and got it through it wasn't easy and there was quite a lot of convincing that needed to be done but they did it in the end and I think the French success in this is we should look at it because they've been doing this your kind of campaigning for some years before and I've met some of the local French groups and they got there in the end um, when they had a government that was sympathetic they were able to get the law changed. So it can be done, and, and I, would, I would urge you all to look at France and how it works. So th those are the countries which, which use the, the Swedish model where it's the buyer of sexual services who is the one who is committing the criminal offence. Before I go on any further, I will tell you about what happens in Britain. Well, it doesn't happen in Northern Ireland, but. Northern Ireland is quite an interesting place, as you're all beginning to realise at the moment with Brexit. Anyway, it doesn't happen like this in Northern Ireland, but it happens like this in England and Scotland and Wales. Prostitution itself is legal. So if you are a woman on your own um, and you are undertaking prostitution, that isn't criminal. But everything else is. Um, going out and looking for it, so being on the streets is, um, or in various forms, and um, it's, it's illegal to be a pimp and it's illegal to run a brothel. And if you are a woman working with other prostituted women in a brothel, that is illegal. Um, so it's very complicated. It does have some upsides. The, what, it, what it was very helpful for, th this particular confusion, was when we had the Olympics in London in 2012, the police just stopped because, as I'm sure you're all aware, there's, there tends to be a lot of prostitution around major sporting events. And sadly, it's just one of those things that happens. But in fact, in London in 2012, it didn't. Because of the, the law in the UK, the police just stopped it. And they, they, they'd stopped a long time before the Olympics, just saying, we're not going to do this, and kind of doing whatever they do to find out who might be going to to sell, sell prostitution at the Olympics and they just said it's a criminal offence, we'll arrest you if you do this. And so it didn't, there wasn't any prostitution around the Olympics. So a system like that in Britain does have good, it, it's upsides. And the other thing that we had to do in the UK, which all EU countries had to do, was to say that it is a crime if a man has sex with a prostitute who has been subjected to force, regardless of the client's awareness of this. So that's in the EU anti-trafficking directive. So that, that should be in force in, this, in Germany as well, because that's actually European law which says that. So any woman, prostituted woman, who has been subjected to force, i.e. any woman who's been trafficked, it is a criminal offence under EU law to, to, to act to um, to do that. So that might be worth hanging on to when you're, when you're doing your campaigning. And I, I, mean, I can, if you want, to contact my office and we can actually okay. give you the, the, the part of the directive. I can, we can actually send you the whole thing. But we can tell you the paragraphs in the directive which, which say that. Um, and that, that, aside what I'm going to tell you about in other European countries, that will apply everywhere. The problem always is with these things is enforcing it. Um, I know in, in Britain it's a bit, you, you, the, the man has to ask the woman, have you been subjected to force? And if she says no, well that's fine. I mean, the problem is, there's no way of enforcing it, but it is there. So, and I think it's worth knowing that that is there in European law. I can quickly go through other countries.